Welcome to Thinking Publicly. This is the 30, 31st day of October in the year of our Lord 2024. 20, hmm. Brain going two directions at once. Um, I was like, yeah, this is in Mexico, I believe this, it's been a while since I've been down the border. So, uh, This is the Day of the Dead, I believe. What is this? The uh, the autumn equinox it's supposed to be, in other words, uh, the the, uh, the daytime, the light and the dark are equal lengths. <sighs> yeah, the day of the dead. From now on, it just gets darker and darker and darker. But uh, uh, which is celebrated among Catholics, it, it it's a pagan. It's actually a pagan day. Uh, but uh, uh, All Saints Day, I believe. They call it yeah, down in Mexico, which is Catholic. Uh, what they do is they go out and give uh, gifts to their dead relatives. You know, leave them a small body, a, a bottle of whiskey. That's a popular one, especially with the priests. It's a very popular gift for the priests. Uh, and other things uh, that, in, that your departed relatives uh, would uh, like wherever they are. And then the priests go out and they <coughs> rummage through the cemeteries and pick up all the goodies. I guess that's, this is a Roman Catholic version of Halloween, which is really from the Druids. And, and for English, this is from the Druids. And they, they would go around trick or treat in other words, you either give us something. It was a day of extortion. Give us something or we'll put a curse on you. That was it. It was a system of extortion. Uh, the Druids were, well, they engaged in things like human sacrifice. and They were Satanists. Uh which it describes most of humanity, really. Uh, let's go to the scripture. <clears throat> Very early in the morning, again. Doesn't matter. I had plenty of sleep. Uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse, uh, starting at verse 19. Oops, wrong one. Wrong button. There we go. This is also found in Luke by the way. Then a certain scribe, a scribe was a person that made their living basically from copying the, the Jewish scriptures. Uh, they didn't have printing presses. So <laughs> they had to do it manually. So, uh, and they were also experts in the law and the prophets because when you copy something for a living, you know exactly what it says. You have it memorized. If you want to memorize something, write it down copy it several times, and he's pretty much there. So these people, they were regarded as experts, uh, sort of lawyers in a sense, because you could ask them, what did Moses say about this? And they knew. They knew. They may not have understood it, but they knew what the words were. So a certain scribe came to him, uh, came and said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Uh, so Jesus, as a rabbi, you'd have a group of disciples, a group of followers. And they still do, especially among uh, the uh, uh, Hasidics, the Hasidim, the ultra-Orthodox. They, they follow, generally follow a particular rabbi. Uh, it's sort of an apprenticeship system, which is much better than what we do today as far as education. So he said, I'll follow you wherever uh, you go. And Jesus said to him, so he wants to be his, his, his disciple. Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. I, I remember I knew a uh, Church of Christ preacher that... Uh, uh, apparently had been taught the prosperity gospel at the Church of Christ college he went to. I had a professor there that 
that uh, believed that Jesus was rich, very wealthy. And of course, that appeals to the flesh. So this guy believed it too, which is evidence. He probably wasn't saved, but yeah. Just like there was, a, there was another preacher in this town, a, uh, a woman that was the preacher at the Methodist church. Uh, there's a lot of Methodist churches around here. And uh, <clears throat> I even know where there's one for sale. <laughs> nice little country church. I wonder why. <laughs> anyway, uh, actually right now, most, I think most of the uh, ministers and the Methodists are women. Probably increasingly so. That's beside the point. Anyway, uh, he believed that Jesus was rich, and he actually, uh, like the scripture like this, he would say, well, that was just at that moment. He had a house. He had an accountant. Judas Iscariot was his accountant. He had so much money, he had to have an accountant to keep track of it. Because that's what his professor told him. He didn't learn that from the Bible. Oh, I am not keen on preachers. I'm, I've seen too many bad ones. Very few good ones. Very few good ones. I do not know why they're doing what they're doing. Well, I do, but I don't want to talk about it. It's the flesh. Is no, I have no place to lay my head. So Jesus would discourage people that wanted to follow him. See, you ha Jesus had a certain standard. He said, if you're not willing to go up that hill and get crucified up there, you can't follow me. You can't follow me. Uh, you must love me more than you love everything else, including your own life. More than your father, more than your mother, more than your children, more than your wife. You must love me more than your possessions and more than yourself. More than you love yourself. Because... That's where you might go. You might follow me up that hill to the cross. And more than one of the uh, apostles ended up being crucified. Yeah. <sighs> Including Peter. So if you don't love him more than your own life, you can't follow him because he might require that of you. Well, all of us die. Uh, well, I shouldn't say all of us. There's there's exceptions for a large number at the end of the age. Soon. So what's it called? The rapture. The, those who are alive and left when Christ returns will be caught, transformed and caught up to meet him in the air without dying. So just if you don't believe what the Bible teaches, I'm sorry. I, I can't help you. <laughs> you got... But uh, so the other, another disciple came to him and said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Then he got into a boat and his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, O oh, ye of little faith, <laughs> why are you fearful, O oh, you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. This is, he did this more than once, by the way had something similar to this happen. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is important. Why are you following him? Is he just another rabbi? Now, who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? Then he goes on to... Uh, to uh, the, to meet a couple demon-possessed men over on the east side of the sea there. Um, apparently that happened more than once. 
Uh, no, actually, this is, there, there must have been two, but the, one of the other Gospels only has uh, the uh, uh, one. I think that's probably in Luke, which is not unusual. When you see a, a discrepancy like that, it's not actually a discrepancy. It's just one puts more detail in or different details than the other. That doesn't mean they are in contradiction. But people that want to find contradictions do find them. They're not there, but... So what I want to talk about is really right here where Jesus says, but he said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Well, I've heard people say, interpret this, well, his father was an old man and uh, the, the, the guy wanted to, wanted to go home and wait for his father to die in six months or a year, and, and then, then he'd come and follow Jesus. Well, that's not what it says. He says, <laughs> let me, it says, uh, he actually says, the, the, another of his disciples, the one that was already following him, said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. So we should just take it for what it says. What does Jesus require of people? People that, that want to loosen what Jesus says. Like when Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, they want to turn that into something other than it really says. Uh, he, he, he demands our allegiance. He demands our devotion. Him above all else. That's the point. And so when he says this, and so, say it's, 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 uh, his father has just died, and, you know, maybe they're going to bury him the next day. Or that day. And he says... Uh, when Jesus says, uh, follow me and let the dead bury the de their own dead. Jesus refers to those that aren't following him as the dead. He refers to those that aren't following him as the blind. And indeed they are, because unless you've been born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless you belong to Christ, you have no life. You are simply the dead, the living dead, the zombies. So Jesus is saying, let the zombies bury their own zombies, the spiritually dead. We don't understand that usually. Most Christians don't understand the Bible. Most Christians are spiritually dead, which is a terrible thing, but it is. It's reality. You must be born again. That's what Jesus said. You cannot, I do not understand how a person can read the New Testament with any understanding and not understand it is not a call to a religious system. It is not like Judaism. It is not like Islam. It is not like Roman Catholicism or Protestantism or, you know, a whole bunch of other systems of religion. Systems of doctrine, systems of worship, systems of organizations of men. It's about a relationship with a person, the one who commands the wind and the waves, a person who is the Son of God, the person who is the only way to God, the person who is the interface between creation and the creator who is God himself and yet he is truly man he is who we must follow he calls people to follow him not go join a church we have forgotten the meaning of pretty much everything. And when I was saved, it was during that period of time that's referred to as the Jesus Revelation, it's often associated with some hippies on the West Coast and Chuck Smith out there. 
uh-uh. It was global. It was happening in Europe. It was happening in the United States. God was calling young people who were disgusted with this world to himself, disgusted with religion. Many of us were Christians, so supposedly. I mean, we were baptized as infants, often. Or maybe we were Southern Baptists. <laughs> baptized for who knows what reason. And whatever, and that's, we, were, we belong to religion. Uh, among my family, we didn't refer to ourselves as Christians, which is something, a term the world gave anyway. Uh, followers of Christ is really what it means. Uh, we were Lutherans, and we were better than the others. We were better than the Catholics. We were better than the Baptists. Perhaps, but but no, it was a system of religion. It was not what Jesus called us to. It was not come and follow me, which is what the Jesus revolution was all about. It was following Jesus. During the uh, uh, Reformation, most of the ref most of the Protest the Protestants, the, what's technically called the magisterial Protestants, the state religion of Protestantism is what it became. It wasn't about following Jesus. It was about reforming Roman Catholicism. So it was Catholic light. That's what Lutheranism is, Catholic light. Sometimes it's not very light at all. Uh, sometimes it, it varies between almost entirely Roman Catholic without a pope, uh, which is like the uh, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. I mean, it's like when you go in a building and you've got Jesus on the cross and all this stuff, uh, it looks like a Roman Catholic church without Mary. That, that, there, there you go, a Roman Catholic church without Mary. Uh, the liturgy... Uh, it's if you're a Christian, you can see Christ there. I mean, you can, you know, we we can understand the symbolism. We can understand the mass. Oh, well, they don't call it the mass, but it's the same thing. Uh, we we can understand baptism. They got it wrong, but we can understand it. We can understand it points to Christ. It's all about Christ. The the mass is a central act of worship in the Catholic Church. They don't understand it. But it's about Christ. It points to him. His death for the sins of the world. He as the atonement. But the problem is, they teach that salvation is through a relationship with the institution of the Roman Catholic Church. Which Pope Francis is completely dismantling now. Have you heard about his, the, uh, the Synod of, on Synodality has now ended, and they've come out with their statement. It's a complete remodeling. It's converting Roman Catholicism into congregationalism. <laughs> it's got completely gutting the whole thing, and uh, now it's going to be based on the, the, the sense of the faithful. So whatever the, the people in the pews believe. Oh, and by the way, all the baptized, all people that have been baptized into Christ. But baptism, actually, they don't so, say those words. Uh, yeah, it's because bapt, baptism in the New Testament was baptism into Christ. It was a public confession that I'm going to follow Christ, that I'm going to belong to him. It was identifying yourself with him, giving him your allegiance. Uh, so it's something an infant can't do. Uh, but, I mean, it, you can get baptized and think that doing that thing makes you a Christian. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Church of Christ, they, do, they, they practice believer's baptism but they're spiritually dead. They think the act does it. It's, it's 
they're an example of something that is the outward form with no reality. It has no spiritual reality to it. It's spiritually dead. And I'm generalizing. I'm generalizing. But historically, yeah, when you're talking about Churches of Christ, Christian Church, they, they are they are big on the form. Uh, that you, like the name on the building has to be a certain thing, and you have to do this. And they're outward forms. But uh, like the Pharisees, they were big in outward forms, but they had nothing inside except death. Jesus, when he excoriated them and said that you're, you're, you're filled with dead men's bones, you're like whitewashed tombs, outwardly attractive, but inwardly full of all manner of corruption. You stink, you're rotted, you're and that's, that's a very good illustration. We are born into this world spiritually dead. We are zombies. We walk and we can talk and we can kill. But there's no life in us. We have biological life, bios, but we do not have true life, which only exists in Christ. Christ eternal life is in the Son in Jesus Christ. And the only way you have it is by being in him and him being in you. Salvation, rest, um, reconciliation with God, restoration with a proper relationship with God, restoration to God's purpose for humanity is found only in Jesus Christ. And apart from him, a personal relationship with him, you are still dead in trespasses and sin. You are still the way you were born, dead, separated from God. By birth, you're born into a zombie race, the spiritually dead. As God said back in the beginning, the day you eat of that tr tree, you shall surely die. And he did. He became spiritually dead. He became cut off from God. And you cannot fulfill God's purpose of humanity being the image of God without God in you. Only God is the image of God. You must have him in you. And for you to be his temple, he must dwell in you. Otherwise, you're a worthless building. So, next Tuesday, the zombies are having their election. I mean, that is sort of a gross but very apropos uh, comparison. Those who are not born again through faith in Jesus Christ, that do not have the Spirit of God in them, who have not been born of God. This is a work that only God can do. Man can't do it. A priest can't do it. You can't do it. Only God can do it. You have to call out to God to save you. Save you from yourself. Save you from your sin. To restore you to a proper relationship with him. Otherwise, you're nothing but a zombie. You can walk, you can talk, and you can kill. But you're dead. Because there is no life in you. Just You're just a walking corpse. And this is not, this is exactly what Jesus is saying. Let the dead bury their own dead. And that's what I have to say about next Tuesday. I'm not going to vote because they're just zombies. These are zombies having an election. So the zombies are going to vote for the United States for apparently. Who knows between now and Tuesday? I wouldn't. The way things have been going recently in this world, who knows what'll happen? But they're going to vote supposedly for either the zombie Donald Trump or the zombie Harris. Let the dead bury their own dead. This is their government. This is their system. This is their world, not mine. I belong to the kingdom of God. 
God is my Father, Christ is my Lord, Savior. He dwells in me. God dwells in me. In this wretched vessel here, I got a zombie body too. The flesh is dead. This is, what you see is child of Adam. But what's, what I am is a child of God. There's a difference. There's a difference between religion and a relationship with God. A religion does not put you in a relationship with God. It has no power. Judaism has no power. It's the religion of the Pharisees. Literally, the religion of the Pharisees. They come from the Pharisees. Modern Orthodox Judaism comes from the Pharisees. Not from Christ, not from God, not from Moses. comes from the Pharisees. And the law, the law of Moses cannot give you life. It can only bring death because the wages of sin is death. Through the law, shall no one will be saved because the law only brings the knowledge of sin. It shows you you're a sinner. It cannot give you life. It can only bring the punishment for sin, which is death, which you're spiritually dead already. You're separated from God, and you will remain separated from God until you come to Christ. Because life is only in him. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Eternal life is in the Son. And a lot of so-called born-again people don't understand this. They don't, they're not actually born again. They think they are because they had an experience or did something. No, it is Christ in you that is the hope of glory. It's what the scripture says. It's a relationship with him. You and him and he and you. That is what Christ, we're called to by Christ. It's not a church. Churches are places where zombies gather. There might be some Christians there, but... No, they're, they're, it's not. It's not that. Christ, it's a relationship. I don't. There, there's all kinds of people out there will mock that. Well, there's they're the zombies because they don't know it. A zombie doesn't know it's dead. This world is full of people that are spiritually dead. They don't know it, but you can see it. If you belong to Christ, you can see it. You know, it's like you know. Ever, ever, for the last year, we've seen this horror of what those who call themselves the 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 people of God, the the uh, the, the descendants of the Pharisees, the Zionists over in Israel, committing atrocious acts in the whole in the sight of the whole world. They don't even deny it, and it is. If you want to join and be a disciple of those, that that whole system is ripping itself apart right now. Anyway, because you've got two contra you've got a contradiction. Once they established the state of Israel, and in sixty seven got possession of the Temple Mount, there 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 became a contradiction that will destroy. Uh, you you can. Uh, Orthodox Judaism, which is a religion that was crafted by the rabbis for a people in exile, cannot coexist with the Zionist state of Israel, especially in possession of the Temple Mount. And this is why, and we're seeing it today, we're seeing this, this with, with the current regime in Israel, the radical religious Zionists, and they have this... Uh, uh, because now they have no excuse to not build a temple because they because they are in physical possession of the land. And so they either have to 
throw Moses away. See, again, uh, what we call Orthodox Judaism, Talmudic Judaism, uh, Rabbinical Judaism, is the religion of the Pharisees and was crafted to for the Jews while they were in exile. It's a substitute for the Old Testament covenant. They're not in the covenant. They're, they're outside the covenant because they haven't, they haven't kept the law of Moses. They couldn't keep the law of Moses. So what do you do when you're in exile? Well, the, that's where the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, synagogues come from, a place of, of uh, prayer, a place of instruction, a place where the scriptures are read, and a place of teaching. But that was not part of the Old Testament at all. Synagogues didn't exist. At least they're not part of the Old Testament text. They're, it's not, they came about because the Jews were repeatedly in exile. We don't know the exact origin, but it's a, it's a logical development. And so sometime the, uh, that's where Pharisee came from. They, they, were, they, they were the ones that were trying to, to hold to... Uh, Moses when they couldn't. So they had these traditions that arose that reinterpreted the Torah, the, the five books of Moses and the prophets, uh, and to try to apply it when you couldn't fulfill it because you weren't in the land. You couldn't fulfill the requirements of the law. You had to go up to the temple three times a year. Every male had to go to the temple three times a year, every adult male, and offer sacrifice. That's it. You didn't go to the temple every Sabbath. That's not what they did. No, Sabbath was a day of rest. You had to practice the law, and you couldn't do that when you weren't in the land. Now they're in the land, but rabbinic Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, was created for them being outside of the land in exile. So what's happening now is the, the religious Zionists are saying, we must rebuild the temple because we cannot, we have no excuse for not following what Moses commanded. So you have to, there's this, you, so there, there's a contradiction there. You cannot continue in rabbinic Judaism or Orthodox Judaism, Talmudic Judaism, which was created for you in exile by the rabbis, when you're in the land. So now they're going back to the Old Testament and thinking that God has given us commandment to eliminate all the Palestinians and to rebuild the temple using some examples that are improperly applied from the Old Testament. But the thing is, that's a useless pursuit because there is no life in Moses. Moses spoke of one who is to come and everyone must hear what he says. The law saves no one because no one can fulfill it. No one does fulfill it except for one person. And he inherited the blessings of the law. The law has been fulfilled by Christ. That covenant is no longer in force. It is in him. Your a relationship with God is only possible in Jesus Christ who is the Messiah, the promised one, who has promised to come and create, bring about a new covenant, a covenant that does give life, that does save sinners, not just, and you don't need a repeated sacrifice. There is one finished sacrifice for sins, for the sins of the whole world. No one needs any at new atonement. Catholics keep doing it over and over and over again because they're not in Christ. Otherwise, they know they're forgiven. No, they keep going back. They keep going back. And Protestants do the same. Back and back and back. Because it's not the real thing. They're, they're not looking to Christ. He offered himself for the sins of the whole world. He was crucified. He was dead. He was buried. He got up out of the tomb. He didn't stay dead.
Muslims. I, I, I think the, the, the Quran, if you interpret it properly, according to the revelation that already existed, which is the Injil, the Gospels, the New Testament, when it, when it says he was not crucified, what they, I think what they, the misunderstanding is they think it doesn't actually, you know, it's the, the Quran itself isn't really clear on this. He didn't die in a normal way, nor did he stay dead. So when somebody says, well, yeah, yeah, he, Jesus couldn't have been crucified. Or they, they what the, usually I think this is, comes from other sources, but they, they claim that uh, the hadith and the other traditions say that that he uh, that God did a switcheroo and it was actually Judas that was crucified in Jesus' place. No, that's backwards. Jesus was actually crucified for Judas, for the sins of the whole world. But that forgiveness, that atonement that he purchased is only present in him. You must be in him to partake of that atonement. You must be in him to partake of the gift of eternal life, to partake of the, the finished work that Jesus brought in, of the new covenant, all the promises of the new covenant. You must be in him. It's a personal relationship with him. You must belong to him. You must be in him, and he must be in you. As the Apostle Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul says, examine yourselves. Do you not know that Christ is in you? The Spirit of Christ is in you? The Spirit of God is in you? Unless you fail the test? In other words, it should be something we're able to perceive. It's not simply a doctrine, a teaching. It's a reality more real than flesh and blood, more real than matter and energy. And so, like Jesus said, follow me and let the dead bury the dead. Well, that's my attitude for next Tuesday. Let the dead bury the dead. Because it's just a bunch of zombies holding an election for who will rule over the zombies. What does that have to do with me? What does that have to do with Jesus Christ? What does that have to do with his people, who are the church? There's only one church, and it's composed of all those who belong to Jesus Christ. Not these organizations that claim to be the one true church. They're not the church. The church is made up of those who belong to Jesus Christ. It's not an organization. Christ himself is the head of the church, not some substitute that calls himself Pope or whatever, patriarch. Christ himself, or pastor, Christ himself is the head of the church. The living head of his body. Your body is, the body is in relationship to the head. We all, all who are in Christ, we are his living temple that he is building. Why can't people understand that? Because they're dead. Until you're born again, you cannot see or perceive the kingdom of God. You don't have the ability to see it. You cannot enter the kingdom of God either because you must be born again. The Spirit of God must be in you to be part of his kingdom. It's a relationship, a very, very deep and intimate relationship. It's not some outward thing. It doesn't consist of knowledge. It doesn't consist of of knowledge of doctrines or 
or practices. It's a living thing. It's a living relationship. Anything else is not real. It's not the thing. And, and the churches, when the Jesus Revolution take place, they could not figure this out. What is going on? As my grand, one of my grandfathers would have said, what are all these long-haired hippie freaks doing with Jesus? Uh, I don't know if... He, I can imagine him saying that. But I don't know if he actually said that. But It was, it was a puzzlement. They, people in, in churches did not understand. And then... And we who are born again, we have a, a puzzlement too. Like, uh, we cannot understand ourselves because we still live in dead bodies, zombie bodies, but there's all this, this also life in us, eternal life, Christ himself dwelling in us. As Paul says in Romans chapter 7, we have this situation where we find ourselves doing things that, that we don't want to do as and not doing what we want to do. Why? Because the flesh and the spirit are at war with one another. So we cannot do what we want to do. We're, our bodies don't obey us. There's the, uh, the flesh is spiritually dead. It's still in us while we're in these mortal bodies. Well, then there's the blessed hope. Christ is going to return. And that's going to be it. done. Or you die and you go to you go immediately go into his presence without a body. But yeah, um, so you know, there's a lot of people that call themselves Christians and they're all worked up about elections and laws and all this meaningless junk that has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. Follow Christ, but a lot of them aren't interested in that. I don't think most people that go to church, most people that call themselves Christians, they do not know Jesus Christ. And that's a terrible thing. And of course, Jews do not know Jesus Christ. Muslims do not judge, you know, go, uh, know Jesus Christ. You're welcome to find him. You come to him. You have to have a relationship with him. He provided atonement for the entire world, but it, that atonement is in him. There's room for all. Just ask. Ask him. Ask God for what he has for you, what prepared for you already, already paid for by Christ. Forgiveness of all your sins, past, present, and future. It's all in him. Would you like to know God? That's in him. It's one of the promises of the new covenant. Would you rather prefer the covenant of Moses? that only condemns you, that no one can keep? You want to end up like Ben Shapiro, trying to prove you're superior to everybody else by bashing them in your debates? <laughs> like, wow. Here's a guy that's... You look at him, you see a microcosm of what's going on with the Zionists. Terrible thing. Believing you're God's chosen people when you're not. And you spend all your time proving you're not his. By your wickedness. Which you think is doing a favor for God. Jesus prophesied the day will come when those who kill you, referring to Christians, will think they're doing God a favor. The Zionists are killing Christians. They, they hate Christians more than they hate, hate Muslims. In, in Jerusalem, I mean, Christian women are routinely spit on if they're visually identifiable as Christians. Religious, especially, the religious women. They're spit on. The, the young kids are trained to spit on them. They generally don't pick on the men too much. 
because they might get a fist in their face. But they pick on women, on the weak, on those that know, they know will not do anything. I can't believe, I, I do not understand how Christians can support them in what they do. How can a Christian do that? There seems to be a big confusion. I think we need another name other than Christian. It doesn't come from God anyway. It comes from humanity. People that call themselves Christians but don't follow Christ aren't. They are not Christians. People that call themselves Christians and don't have the Spirit of God in them are not Christians. The Spirit of Christ in them. They are just part of a religion that calls itself Christianity, but isn't. You need the real thing. And don't be deceived. If you're a Christian, you're not of this world. Don't waste your time Tuesday trying to bury the dead. Trying to fix this world is a lost cause. God has a replacement for it. It's a replacement for this government. This government's not fixable. This nation is not fixable. This world is not fixable. Christ is the answer. The only answer. God is the only answer. Everything else is vanity. Everything else is the life of zombies, the dead. What do we have to do with the election of the zombies? Christ is our king. We are not of this world. Don't forget that. It's so easy because we live in this world. We're surrounded by all this noise and chatter and racket. All these lies, lies heaped upon lies upon lies. That's what this world is. It's a big lie. Only Christ is real. Only in him is life. Don't forget that.